I watched the entire three hour long Blackmagic and AB announcement video, so you don't have to. Here's what you need to know. Blackmagic just released a boatload of updates, honestly one of the best NAB announcements that I can remember. There's a bunch of new hardware for multicam production workflows. There's updates to Blackmagic Cloud, which include multicam production workflow environment updates. There's DaVinci Resolve 20, which has a ton of new AI-assisted tools. Honestly, CapCut, DaVinci's coming for you, so watch out. But some of these tools include multicam automatic editing, AI music editor, dialogue converter, and smooth cut. There's also software updates for Blackmagic cameras that are going to bring continuous autofocus. Yes, you heard me correctly. That's object tracking and face tracking continuous autofocus that's AI assisted, huge. And if all of that wasn't enough, there's also a new Blackmagic Pixis camera as well as three new Ursa Cine cameras. Right off the bat, there's three new video hubs. So these are SDI matrices, so you can route video uh, however you'd like. So there's a four by two, meaning four inputs, two outputs. There's a six by two, six inputs, two outputs, and finally an eight by four, eight inputs, four outputs, they're all 12G. There's three new Blackmagic 2110 IP converters. The first is the Blackmagic 2110 IP up-down cross converter, so up and down in resolution, cross conversion meaning different frame rates as well. And there is an SDI in as well as an SDI out and loop. There is an HDMI in, HDMI out, and 10G ethernet for SMPTE 2110. In addition to the up-down cross converter, there's also the Blackmagic 2110 IP SDI to HDMI 12G, as well as the Blackmagic 2110 IP SDI to HDMI 12G 10. So both of these have 10G Ethernet 2110 in and out, as well as SDI in and HDMI out. So it's more so for monitoring any of these incoming video feeds. But the interesting thing is that there is analog audio, full-size XLR out. The 10 channel one is exactly the same as far as the video feeds are concerned, but instead of two channels of XLR out, there are 10 channels of XLR out. They also have the labeling of left, right, center, sub, left side, right side, so you can we can see this being used for surround sound or maybe even Dolby Atmos, and that's why I mentioned it's more of an audio thing rather than a video thing. Next, Blackmagic announced the Decklink IP100G, which allows for eight channels of Ultra HD video in simultaneous capture and playback. It features two 100G QSFP ports for full redundancy. They also announced the ATEM4ME Constellation 4K+, Plus, which is identical to the ATEM4ME Constellation 4K, except with double the amounts of inputs and outputs. So for those of you who need 80 inputs and 48 outputs, this is the box for you. I'm gonna put an affiliate link to this, and if one of you people buy it, I think I, 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 I don't know, I don't even know what, but that, that would be amazing. <laughs> it just seems like very niche audience for that one. They also announced the ATEM micro camera panel. So for those of you familiar with the ATEM camera control panel, which has four individual controls of four different cameras, this one is much smaller and allows you to control one camera at a time. But the neat thing about it is that it's battery powered and it's Bluetooth control. So it actually doesn't connect directly to the ATEM ME, it connects to the ATEM software control. So you can just sort of carry it around. Honestly, I always found those big camera control panels a little bulky and sort of unnecessary because you could accomplish most of it and more with the software. That's something to look at, that's interesting. So here's the ATEM micro camera panel right next to the camera control panel. They also announced the HyperDeck Shuttle 4K Pro. And this is one of those Blackmagic products that I feel like I and no one really expected to see and it just makes so much sense now that it's released. Essentially, it's a HyperDeck that is on a table, you mount it, and it has a screen, it's a touch screen, so not only can you use the wheel and the play button and the pause button, all the stuff that you have with the rack-mounted HyperDecks, but you can also actually jog and scrub and do all of that on the screen itself which is fantastic for playing back. So HyperDex, traditionally, you can use them to record video, but also to play back video. This one is clearly much more of, in my opinion, a, a playback device than it is a recording device, and a very interesting one at that. On the HyperDeck itself, you have an HDMI out, so you can have a monitor and really just monitor the feed as well as the screen that you have on the HyperDeck, and the HyperDeck screen can also be used for different scopes. So you've got your waveform, parade, vector scope, histogram, all those scopes you have built in, and then you can output through the HDMI and look and monitor it on the big screen. There's also a new ATEM Mini Extreme ISO G2. I was planning on buying one of these like a month ago. I'm really glad that I held out because this one looks 
fantastic. They've made some key updates on this, which essentially starts with the buttons. It's no longer like the little rubber buttons. They got the same buttons that are being used in the large A10 models or on the, the Hyperdeck models that are rack mounted. You have those buttons on these now, which are much more tactile, better for this type of work. It's eight HDMI inputs, three HDMI routable outputs, so you can choose to whatever three HDMI outs that you want. So for example, multi-view program and a certain camera, if you wanted to have like a backup of a wide camera or something like that. The ATEM is also network accessible through 10G ethernet. So if you record footage, let's say you're recording your multicam cut internal to the ATEM, you can then access it from the computer while it is still recording. So if you needed to do replays, you can actually use that footage in DaVinci Resolve while the ATEM is still recording and then use that for playback. It is still 1080p 60, but in the same vein as all these A10 minis, you can record the cameras in 4K. It still spits out that DaVinci XML and you can always resync it and get that 4K after the fact. Four upstream keyers, four downstream keyers. There's a Thunderbolt cable that allows you to actually bring in video from the computer into the A10 mini as well, which is really cool. And that's about it. I mean, there's a fader for the crossfades. I don't know if that was a, a huge request or not, but there's a fader. There's a fader for it now. Let's enjoy that fader. Some smaller updates. Blackmagic web presenters are changing their name to Blackmagic streaming encoders just because it was a little bit confusing. I guess they were originally some sort of encoder and then they decided to alter them and update them so that they can stream directly from the Blackmagic web presenter. So they're changing the name so it makes more sense. They're now called Blackmagic Streaming Encoder. Also updates to the Blackmagic Streaming Bridge. There's a new product called the Blackmagic Streaming Decoder 4K. In fact, there's two new products. There's the Blackmagic Streaming Encoder 4K and the Blackmagic Streaming Decoder 4K. It works exactly the same as the Streaming Bridge, but now it's Ultra HD and it's rack mountable. Essentially, it allows you to encode and decode video over the internet. So if you have a camera operator in a different city, you can bring in that video feed into your ATEM. You can also control that camera from your ATEM because it sends tally information as well as iris control, camera control, etc. The Blackmagic Cloud is getting some very cool updates. One of them as it relates to streaming is the ability to send your video feeds when as we were just talking about these encoders and decoders, the ability to send those video feeds to the Blackmagic Cloud and then bring them down down to the ATEM, for example. Historically, you would have to sort of set up the whole network, make sure you're using static IPs. It was generally not super user-friendly. Now you can do it all through the Blackmagic Cloud. Also, there's a new DaVinci Resolve monitor app, which allows you to monitor anything that's coming in through the cloud. The Blackmagic Camera app on phones is also getting an update. Not only can you record and use that beautiful Blackmagic user interface, you can now stream using that app to the Blackmagic Cloud as well. So this is bringing some very cool new workflows, like the ability to use that Blackmagic app on your phone to stream as another camera into the ATEM while using that decoder. So you can be anywhere in the world interviewing someone, for example, on that Blackmagic app on your phone, send it through the internet to Blackmagic Cloud, decode it on the input to the ATEM, and get it as an additional feed on your 1ME, for example. Super cool. This is a great example of what I love about Blackmagic. They are so good at making these products that just make professional quality production, especially as it relates to multicam and streaming. They're putting it in the hands of regular people. And even a professional production can make use of phone footage out in the field. How many times are we watching broadcasts these days and the interviewers are on Zoom? That's the new standard. So the fact that we can incorporate that into a professional workflow is amazing. Another update to the Blackmagic Cloud is the ATEM Cloud Constellation. Essentially what it is, it's a four input ATEM on the cloud, meaning that you can do a multicam edit on your computer now by renting a constellation from Blackmagic on the cloud. We are seeing the direction of no longer needing hardware in order to do these live multicam edits. I think they said that this is gonna be a later announcement because they're still working on it to make sure it works. We can now soon do full four cam multicam edits strictly on the computer. Oh, also one thing that I almost forgot to mention is the hardware switcher control panel for the ATEM software control. Now, I had never heard of it. I don't know if this was announced before, but I feel like Grant Petty, he sort of brushed over this and I feel like this is a huge 
huge announcement, the hardware switcher control panel. So essentially it's again, similar to the camera control. It's a wireless battery powered panel that allows you to control the ATEM software control. So you no longer have to plug in the whole shebang. You still need obviously an ATEM switcher. So for example, if you have a, a four camera switcher, you still need that, but you no longer need to hog. Everyone's working on that same thing. There's a little bit more space now with this hardware switcher control panel, as well as the camera control panel. So going back to that hardware switcher control panel, if we're able to soon do four camera multicam edits on the cloud, we really only need that hardware control panel, and then we can sort of remote edit live multicam. That's just... <laughs> what is going on? That is fantastic. Okay, let's talk about DaVinci Resolve 20. DaVinci Resolve 20 has a bunch of new AI features. There's a bunch of other features as well, but it seems like they really, really went down the AI train this time around. And honestly, CapCut, pfft, we used other tools for certain things, and there definitely there was a reason to use CapCut. We used something called Vid.io as well. We used Eleven Labs for AI voiceover. There were other tools that we were using, and it seems like Blackmagic just took all of those tools and threw it into DaVinci. So I'm just gonna read off of this because honestly, there's so much to go through and I will not remember all the names. So here we go. One of the features is called IntelliScript. Essentially, you upload a script of, let's say, a narrative film that you just shot, and the AI will select the best takes, put them in the timeline, and then any alternate takes will be positioned on top of what the AI considers the best take and disable them. AI music editor. For backing tracks, for example, you can now adjust the song length and the AI will listen to the song and make the appropriate cuts where it makes the most sense. Audio assistant. You can use the AI audio assistant to essentially organize tracks based on dialogue, music, or sound effects. It will go through all the audio tracks, label them accordingly, and then do a mix based on that organization. Voice convert. You can use AI to change someone's voice on screen. So if I wanted to sound more like a British man or an Australian woman, for example, you can use these AI tools to change someone's voice. There are four voices built into DaVinci, two male, two female. However, the more interesting use case of this, I would say, is if you're recording audio in a subpar environment with tons of noise, you can then upload, for example, my own voice into DaVinci, it will take that recording, listen to the original audio, and replace it with the sound of my voice in a better recorded environment. Dialogue matching. So this is similar to color matching, where if you have one clip that looks very different than another, it'll color match to the reference clip. Dialogue matching, essentially, if you have one clip that's very reverberant, and then another one that's recorded in a studio, you can choose one as the reference and make the other one sound like that one. You can use PSD files in DaVinci now. You can open the different layers and manipulate them differently. AI multicam smart clip. So this is, for example, if you have a podcast with three different cameras, each on a different person, AI multicam smart clip will go through the footage. It will realize who is the person speaking and edit to match whoever's speaking at that time. AI super scaling allows you to enhance video by two, three, or four times for additional zoom, sharpness, and noise reduction. AI set extender. If I wanted to have more space on top or to the left and to my right, I could zoom into this frame and then AI set extends to have more room. For Fusion, there's a bunch of improvement for deep images and layers. The color tab now has something called AI magic mask, which is similar to in Photoshop. For example, if you wanted to select someone's face or select an object on screen, you can now do that within DaVinci and it tracks that object throughout the scene. Fairlight has improved audio tools as well, such as better automation tools. You can change channel automation. They no longer all have to be global. You can change it per track. You can use AI to remove silences and silent sections. There's also a new checkerboard feature, which for example, if you upload a single stereo file of two people speaking, the AI will analyze it and then checkerboard it to two individual tracks based on the timbre of people's voice so that you can manipulate the sound separately. And lastly, as far as these cool AI tools are concerned in DaVinci Resolve, there's an EQ matcher and a level matcher. So you can choose a reference clip and then match the other clip to it based on EQ or based on level. On the deliver page, there's also a quick export dialog box that you can create your own presets. And also there is a new Vision Pro output because they, well, they have this whole new Ursa Cine immersive camera, so they also have a, a new export option for Apple Vision Pro. Oh, and in DaVinci, there's also a new keyframes tab, the top left, huge. I mean, honestly, I always felt that the keyframe workflow in DaVinci was fine if you didn't make it too complex, but now there's a whole tab dedicated to it. You can click it and it's much easier to visualize. Love that. Okay, so talking about the updates for the camera. So, so far, it seems like what we know is that it's gonna be on the 
Cinema 6K as well as the Pixis 6K. They're gonna have a Blackmagic camera update called 9.5, I believe, where they're going to include continuous autofocus. And it is AI assisted and it will be able to track faces as well as objects. So in the example that Grant Petty did, they, he had two people side by side and it would track both faces simultaneously and you could press on one person's face, track that person, continuously track them, and then press on the other person's face. But it will continuously track both people and focus on one of the two. Honestly, I thought Blackmagic just gave up on autofocus. It has been so long, it seemed like they didn't really care about it. I feel like the Blackmagic community sort of ended up deciding we don't care about this either, we're professionals. Uh, and so we will always have a focus puller. But this, to be honest, I think this is gonna change, this is gonna change the game for a lot of people. I am now considering whether Blackmagic might be the right tool for me. As a YouTuber, I like that autofocus workflow and I've always loved Blackmagic for everything else. The only reason I shoot on Sony really is because of the low light and that autofocus workflow. So this is huge in my opinion and I think we're gonna hear a lot more about this soon. Oh, and by the way, there's a public beta out right now. So if you have the Blackmagic Cinema 6K, you can test out this autofocus now. It is live on the website. Please tell me what you think. I would love to know how good it is. There's also a new update that allows you to pre-record. So for example, uh, you can set the camera if you're simply like walking around, the camera is always set to pre-record 10 seconds before you hit record, meaning that it's sort of recording in the background. So if you absolutely need to get something and you don't wanna miss it, there's a new setting which allows you to pre-record. Apparently you can alter the length in the menu. What we saw on the stream was 10 seconds. Beyond that, I don't know how much longer it is that you can set that pre-record function. Another update for those of you who watched my Blackmagic Micro Studio 4K G2 video is we can now use the Blackmagic Pixis monitor on the Blackmagic Micro Studio 4K G2. That's great for two reasons. One, you get an extra port out of the camera, so you have SDI, and HDMI that can now be used because that USB-C is only really for the monitor. And two, you can control the camera from the monitor because it's a touchscreen monitor. So long gone are the days where you have to hold the monitor and sort of finagle the camera like this. Awesome, just 10 out of 10. I love these updates. I'm so excited. This, I honestly, I did not make it to NAB 2025 and I'm starting to regret it because I think this NAB has some better Black Magic products than the one last year. However, I still love my time at NAB 2024. I just simply couldn't make it out this year. So there's Ursa Cine 12K, there's a new Ursa Cine 17K, and then the Ursa Cine Immersive. So the Ursa Cine 12K, we sort of had a 12K last year. The main difference is that now we can also order these with just the body only. So that was one of the big complaints that a lot of us had. We own a bunch of accessories already. And the fact that we needed to buy this camera with the viewfinder and the top handle and all these additional accessories, not everyone loved that. So Blackmagic, they listened to us. Grant Petty mentioned that on the stream. This is a complaint that they had. So now we can buy the body only for the 12K as well as the 17K. And I believe that's gonna be the case with the immersive, but that one's still on pre-order, so TBD. There's also a new Blackmagic Pixis. The only two differences really is it's a full frame 12K sensor, 10G ethernet, which is great because it allows that remote accessibility of file management. So if you have it connected while shooting, you can then access those files while shooting, or as soon as you're done shooting, you can start editing. That's really cool. And then apparently the USB-C is a little bit faster as well. There's some new accessories for the Blackmagic Pixis as well. Essentially a top handle and a side handle, which makes the whole Pixis feel a lot more like a camcorder and the whole idea behind it was exactly that, essentially to make the Pixis a little bit more broadcast friendly. The top grip has a zoom control as well as a stereo microphone. The side grip also has that zoom control. Honestly, it's kind of similar to the FX6 that I have over here, the top handle and the side handle it makes the Pixis feel much more like a camcorder. And last but not least, there's a new Cintel scanner as well, eight millimeter and 16 millimeter HDR compatible. So that was everything that was discussed during the stream. Thank you guys so much for watching. And let me know in the comments below, what was the product or update that you were the most excited for? See you.